Can you see my screen? We can see your screen, but no slides at the moment. Right. Um, I'm going to do an interactive demonstration mm -hmm. instead of slides. Ah, OK. So um, hopefully this will go OK. Um, so we built a tool called mm -hmm. True. It, the project is called True Blocks. Can I, I assume everybody can hear me. I'll, I'll, uh, All fine. Minute. Great. Yeah. OK, so we built a tool. The project is called True, True Blocks. And the tool is called Shifra, which is kind mm -hmm. of a play on the word cipher. And just like Git provides a bunch of subcommands, Shifra provides a bunch of subcommands. So I'm just going to go through like uh, five or six of these subcommands to show you uh, how we, uh, what, what we built and how it lets us extract data about any smart contract or any address really, um, kind of as deeply as we want to, um, to go into the data. Um, I'm going to use the Gitcoin grant as an example. Uh, to show you uh, what we can see and how maybe this can be helpful in your work if you're doing um, uh, data analysis on really any smart contract. So um, the commands are broken into a couple of different groups. I'm going to talk first about the blockchain related data. This is data that we're querying directly from an Ethereum node, very similar to the RPC in a lot of ways. We use these tools to build a tool that we call Scrape, which will scrape the Ethereum chain and build a, a list of what we call appearances. So anywhere an address appears, anywhere in any block, we want to build an index of that. And then we're, I'm going to show you these two commands, which... Hey, Jay. Yep. I'm not, I, I think I only see your desktop uh, background. I'm not sure if you have a demo up. Hold on a second. Sorry. Um, no. It's loading. Thanks for interrupting me. Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt. It was getting so exciting. <laughs> uh, it's, it's like a really cool problem. So if I do screens, entire screen, or should I do applications and just show the? Uh... I usually do entire screen. Yeah. Um, go live. Yes, I see your wallpaper, your desktop wallpaper now. Now do you see a? Terminal or? No. Oh, shit. Sorry. Does anybody have any suggestions? I don't know how to show my terminal. Um, and did you try just sharing the terminal as a single application? As well? Or? Yeah, yeah, close the stream uh, and then try just yeah, the now terminal. I'm, now I'm just sh sharing the terminal. Are people seeing that or no? I think it's a permission item. I had the same uh, thing, uh, you know, uh, Sean. <laughs> mm. You need to 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 uh, give Discord permission to to share your screen in the uh, somewhere in the settings of your PC. Uh, is there any? Uh, Do you have a, an Apple or a, or just Windows, then I'm lost. <laughs> Does anybody have any advice for me here? I really do want to. Um... Yeah, maybe let's check. What operating system are you using? This is Apple. This is Apple, OK. Then you might want to go to uh, system settings. And then there's um, a setting for, what is it? Um, security privacy, I think. or privacy? Well, yes, I think security. Privacy. Privacy. Yeah. And then you, s there is an in the in the menu there, um, you can find screen recording. So go to security, and then screen recording is something 
Yep. Not too much. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it, looks like it, might, it looks like I might have to come, uh, I'll quit out and then be right back. Sorry. Well, ah. we, we, we got yep. it in here. Great. Oh, wait, you can see my screen? Yep. Yep. We see it. Do you see my terminal? My terminal? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, cool. Let's go. Um, so anyway, I was saying that we have uh, a tool called Shifra command, Shifra, and it lets us do subcommands just like Git. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about these set of commands. I'm going to show you one or two of these. Then I'm going to talk about a command called scrape, which builds on top of these commands. These commands hit the blockchain data directly. Uh, we're running a local Ethereum node. So if I do uh, SSH into the machine, and then, uh, so this is our locally running Ethereum archive node. Um, you can use a remote um, Infura node or any other remote node you want. Uh, it's much faster if it's local, so we run it locally. Um, so I'm going to talk about these commands. Then I'm going to talk about scraping. And scraping reads the chain and builds an index of address appearances. So an address appearance, as I'll explain that as I go, um, is any place where an address appears anywhere in the data. And once we have this index, then we can build commands that do a list of every appearance of, of an address anywhere on the chain. And this gives you a full and detailed history of any address. I'm going to use the Gitcoin grants address as, a, as the example. And then export lets you export details of these appearances. And we're going to look at the logs of um, the Gitcoin grant address. And I'm just going to talk about some other things as I go. Um, these, Jake, Jake, yes? maybe can you give some more context for those who are not that familiar with archive nodes, with how transactions are recorded uh, on Ethereum? Sure. sure. So the, the, the node software provides something called the RPC, which is a, an interface to query the node. Um, I actually think that it's inadequate for stuff like data science because it's, it doesn't really give you what you want. And I'll show you an example of that. So one of the um, RPC commands is get block by number. So if I were to type that in, I would get a block. I might type get block by number 1,000 or something like that. Um, we placed in front of that a command called blocks, which lets us get any block we want. Um, and that's the data that comes directly from the archive node. So this is just an arbitrary block that we pulled. Another command from the archive node is get block by hash. So you can query the block by hash. But if you want to do data analysis, this is a little cumbersome because you have to do this for every block. So we extended this, and this is the first thing we kind of did was extend the RPC to make it more usable for people. So we extended, I'm going to get every block between uh, 1.1 1, 1 million and say 2.2 uh, 2 million. And, and that is, uh, I'm sorry. So this is a block range. So now I'm getting every block the, between 1 million and 2 million. And then we can do different kinds of stepping. So once every thousand blocks or something like that, or weekly, if we wanted to do weekly or something like that. And we can do this and then we can extract various parts of the data. So that's the difficulty in every block, every 100 blocks. And then we can start doing different analysis based on that data. So that's just a really simple example mm -hmm. of what we did. We kind of extended the RPC to make it more usable. Um, I'm going to show you one other example with this uh, blocks uh, command. So if I look at block 7.1 million, uh, that's the data. Um, let, me, let me look at a newer block, like 11 million. So you can kind of see that takes a little while. And that was running against my own chain, which is right in my own building. If it's against Infura, it's even longer. So another thing we built was a cache into our, uh, into our thing. So you can force the data into a cache. There you can see it takes a while, but the next time you get it, it's almost instantaneous. So 
uh, another thing that we did was we, we never extract any data at all from the chain until the user tells us to, and then we cache everything they ask for so that it gets faster and faster. So th the more you ask for, the bigger your cache gets, but you also get a usable, fast access to the data that you want. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want, uh, if anybody has any questions, you can interrupt as I go. I have no problem with that. Um, so yeah, any questions on here at that point on nodes, transaction data, anyone? Feel free to ask because then. Yeah, please interrupt if you if I'm going too fast or confusingly. Um, so, um, if you look at this data. It's pretty complicated and there's a lot of stuff. This is a single block. There's about 300 transactions in here. And many of these transactions are generating all kinds of events and logs and traces and all this data. And what we're interested in is things like this, where the data was the from address. So we're gonna pick that off and put it in our index. Uh, a lot of times the addresses will appear in the event data or they frequently they appear inside of the input data to the function. So um, I don't see a good example here, but um, we also pick data off if we see it here. This is the number one, but if we see a bunch of strings of characters here, we think it's an address and then we pick that off. So that gets summarized by this command, unique transaction. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, so so what this is, is the block data for block one, 11 million. And this is each of the transactions. And then this is each of the traces inside of those transactions. And this is every address that we found in this block, unique per transaction. So we can take this data and build our index of appearances. So here, this record says that block, the miner won that block, so the miner appears in that block. And here it is the first transaction. And down here you start seeing logs that get generated. So, so what we're doing is we're picking every address we can find from any block. And then we can span blocks, so 11,205,000 or something. So now we're looking at a bunch of different blocks. And you can see this is not cached, so it takes a little bit of time to get the data, but um, uh, we can cache that. Um, so that is kind of fundamental to the next command I'm gonna show you, which is called scrape. So the scraper basically visits every block and creates an index. So that's this command. And it says, scrape the chain and build an index. So I can start that off here. So the last time I ran the uh, scraper was 31,000 blocks ago, and this is scraping 2,000 blocks at a time. It's gonna take about uh, a minute or two to scrape 2,000 blocks and pull all of the addresses off. So I'm just gonna let that run for one second. And I wanna show you another command that we have, which is called Shifra serve. So Shifra serve takes each of these different tools and presents them as an API route. So that's serving data. And then I can open um, an application. So the whole point for us is to get unlimited permissionless access to the blockchain data without having to go to like a third party website to get data. So we built all of these tools kind of in support of this front end, but they can also be used for data analysis. Um, but here I'm gonna use, uh, this is my TrueBlocks wallet, and I'm scraping the, uh, this is showing that I'm scraping the data to get the data for, um, to present the history of this address in every place that it ever showed up anywhere on the chain. And, um, this is kind of the basic thing that we're building is this front end so that people can actually understand where their money came from and where their money went to. So everywhere it shows green, that's my wallet. And everywhere where th this transaction, um, someone mentioned us in a 
transfer, but we didn't actually participate directly in this transaction. So this is where uh, people have a lot of trouble finding this kind of data. Um, I'm gonna just uh, quit this scraper for a second and uh, move on because I think I'm getting a little sidetracked, but um, I wanted to show you this command, Shifra list, and I wanna talk about this command, Shifra names. So Shifra names lets us collect information. So we've collected a lot of information on Gitcoin. We use Gitcoin's APIs to collect addresses. Um, and I can say grant here. So this is every one of the Gitcoin grant addresses and their names that we extracted from the Gitcoin API. Um, and then we've also collected the Gitcoin uh, core contracts. And this is the Gitcoin grant contract here. Um, and then I can use the Shifra list command, which lists every appearance of an address anywhere on the chain. So I'm going to say Shifra list the Gitcoin grant contract. And that is now scraping this index that the um, scraper created. And if you tried to do this against the Ethereum node directly, and I'm not exaggerating, this would take weeks to get that list right there of 19,000 appearances because there is no index on the, on the, um, uh, on the uh, archive node. So this is kind of my idea of kind of what the fundamental problem with the archive node is or with, with any of the nodes is, is it doesn't have an index. So we, we built the index so that we can make it accessible. So now we have 19,000 records. That took about five seconds. The second time we do it, it takes less than a second because we've cached all that data. And now that we have the list for the Gitcoin grant contract, we can export the Gitcoin grant data. So this is the, this is every transaction that ever happened um, and pulling out exactly the transactions that we're interested in, which is the ones that the Gitcoin grant was involved with. And you can see that it's actually pretty fast. So the node is actually a pretty good database if it has an index. If the node doesn't have an index, it's a terrible database. And that's why I think a lot of people have trouble getting useful data directly from the node. So now we have a list of, uh, I call this everything that ever happened on that address, but it's kind of too much information. So you can actually um, lessen the amount of information you get per address by asking only for the logs or only for the traces or, we actually do accounting on the data, so only for the accounting. Um, I'm just gonna do logs here. And now we're looking at only the places, only the transactions where the Gitcoin address appears in a log. And we get this kind of data from the blockchain, but it's not really good data. It's kind of complicated and hard to understand data. Um, but there's probably about 75,000 records here because 19,000 transactions creates, each of them creates about 20, no, about 10 uh, events. So we're, we're looking at just the events that the um, Gitcoin grant address was uh, involved with. Uh, but that's even more, that's kind of blockchain byte data, which is almost impossible to understand. So another command is called ABIs. Now here is the only place where we kind of go out to a third party. We, we can't get this ABI information from, um, from the chain. So we actually have to go to Etherscan to get this information. But this is for this smart contract, it's the Gitcoin grant smart contract. This is the uh, ABI for that contract. And we're interested in this event right here called the donation sent event. So I'm going to um, go back to this logs command and I'm going to say articulate. And what articulate does is it reads this ABI from Etherscan and then it turns this data back into something that's readable. So now we can see that this event gets translated what we call an articulated event and it has the full details. And then we even create a, a compressed event, which this is actually C code, so we could actually write a C program from this data. So I'm just gonna let that run for a few seconds. 
Uh, I'm going to turn off JSON. I'm just going to let it produce uh, text data. And I'm going to cut the first, second, third, and 11th field. And now we're going to see, I'm going to do one other thing, sorry. Can everybody hear me okay? I hope so. I hear you okay. I can see the terminal, really like in watching metrics. Okay, so th um, are you seeing the terminal? Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is every event that the Gitcoin grant ever appeared in, or it's every trans it's the event from every transaction that the Gitcoin grant appeared anywhere in the transaction. And I'm showing just the uh, compressed version of the of the event. But that's still a little bit confusing. So now I just want to eliminate everything but events that the Gitcoin grant emitted. So we can say emitter. And this is every event that the Gitcoin grant ever committed or um, you know expressed. And this is the data that I think we want for our analysis of the Gitcoin grant, because this is every piece of data. And I want to make the point that I'm running my own node. I'm running on my own, my own desktop computer. I don't have to ask anybody to get access to this data. It's 100% completely permissionless. I'm hitting against my node really hard, but I'm not being rate limited because I'm not sharing my node with anybody. I'm not sharing this, this, um, analysis with anybody. So, and I'm caching everything really heavily so that I get a usable access to the archive data. Um, so I can uh, do, now I'm gonna just uh, grep for anything that goes to the Gitcoin or to the uh, Truebox uh, address. Uh, sorry, I made a mistake. Shifra names Truebox. So I'm gonna find any donation that was given to true blocks. So that's the, the red is true blocks. So that's every donation in Gitcoin grant sent to true blocks or sent from true blocks. So I have a short other uh, demo if anyone's interested or I can stop here and take some questions. I have a question. Yeah. So Jay, I'm wondering when you say the index on on the node, what what's the mechanism? What does that actually look like? What is the index? Is there sort of like do you have a SQL database going, or is this uh, just a text file, or is it on the node somehow? How how does that work? Yeah, um, it is not a database because I'm exploring the possibility of living in a world where databases don't exist, and I, I'll I'll try to explain why I want to live there. Uh, if you take uh, the list of all the addresses in block one, and then you add to it the list of all addresses in block two, you have to sort the index to get a usable index so you, so you can search it. But as soon as you do that, you change the contents of the, of the file. So you can't treat that as an immutable piece of data. So what our indexer does, and I didn't show you this command, but I can show you, um, we have a status uh, command, and I can show you some details about the, um, about the index. And the index is actually um, hundreds of files that have been, um, um, we stop adding new data to the file when it gets to a certain size, and we choose 2 million appearances as that size. It's completely arbitrary. But what that lets us do is create a file that we can do this to, which is we can publish this frozen file because we're not adding any new data to it, to IPFS. And what that lets us do, um, let me just go here for uh, a minute. So we create, uh, this website called the Unchained Index. And what we're saying by the word unchained is the index is off the chain, but it's also released from any uh, single entity kind of holding this index. We want to create this index, but we don't want to become the people that hold this index because then we've just recreated uh, 
everything we're trying to get away from, which is uh, websites that uh, capture us, websites that charge us uh, unduly or, or something like that. So we call this an unstoppable, uncapturable index of everything that ever happened on Ethereum. And we do that by publishing what we call a manifest. So uh, this manifest is a single, this is so interesting to me. It's a single IPFS hash that contains a pointer to every part of the index. And if the community comes together and agrees that this particular collection of data is the list of all the addresses in those block range, then the community can agree that that's the right data. And we never have to consider it again. And we can all share this without taking on hardly any cost because that you are, or that um, IPFS hash literally is every index chunk up until block 10 million, 500,000. And then we only have the problem of publishing new updated um, manifests. So we, we have a way to do that. We kind of publish the previous manifest hash in the new manifest hash, and then we tell you what are the new pieces. Um, so the index is weird because it's not really a database. It's a thing that I want to purposefully share by IPFS. And the reason I want to do that is because my cost as the publisher of this manifest is near zero. I kind of build this on my laptop and I can publish this hash simply by telling people where this, um, where this, uh, IPFS hashes. And I do that by, we created an extremely simple smart contract that um, we call the Unchained Index Smart Contract. And what we do is periodically we publish this hash of where the entire index lives on IPFS. And now our software can actually read the blockchain directly. We can do that. And that's what we do. And we know where our own index is and anyone else who has this hash knows where the index is and they just have to download it. And what's so interesting about IPFS is unlike a website where the more people who desire to get this index, the more resources the website has to take on because they have more traffic. In IPFS, the more people that want this resource the more people will have it, and therefore it's more available to more people. So IPFS is kind of so interesting for this application because it lets us share really cheaply, almost to the point where we can give this index away for free. Um, and the more people that use it, the more available it becomes and the more resilient the system gets. So we're kind of doing all of that on purpose because we want to create an unstoppable, uncapturable index. Um, and then we do a few other interesting things is we put the file format inside of the manifest. So if you have the manifest, you have information enough to decode the data. It's actually binary data. And then we um, also publish the commit hash of the GitHub repo that built this index. So what happens now is every person on the planet Earth with this IPFS hash can get every piece of the data. They can extract every piece of the data because they know the format of the data. And they can download the GitHub repo and reproduce the data if they choose to. So we've created a, an uncapturable index, which is exactly what we're trying to do. So uh, it's a good question. Sorry I went off for like two hours, but I've been thinking about this for a long time. So. That's super That's cool. Super nice cool. nice to get your take on it. Um, if I can just take another minute or two, I'll show you uh, one other demo uh, real quick. Uh, so we're really interested in pricing all of this information. I know pricing is also a, a kind of complicated thing, um, but I think that the pricing information is actually on chain. So here I'm just taking some Shifra commands and I'm putting them in a shell script. So I'm just going to run uh, this shell script. 
And, and what this is doing, it said, I'm going to find the Uniswap factory contract. I know where the wrapped ether is. I know where Tether is. This is the ABI for the Uniswap contract. And I want to do this get pair with these two addresses. And what that returns is the address of the pair contract for Uniswap. And then uh, a second, um, it takes that pair contract and it does kind of the same thing. And this um, tells us what the pair contract is. We're interested in a function called get reserves. So it shows us this is the uh, wrapped ether. This is tether. And we're going to ask uh, the pair contract for get reserves. And we get back two numbers. And if we divide this one by this one, we get the price of ether at this moment. And then because we can um, do this block range, we could do something like, you know, block 10 million to block 11 million weekly. And now we get a weekly price or we can type hourly or blockly and we get block by block prices. It only works for things that have Uniswap contracts, but um, it's a really interesting thing that we've been playing around with. So, uh, so fundamentally, I'll just summarize. Uh, I think it's really important, especially if we're trying to build commons, that individual people have access to this data without asking anyone else permission for the data. Because I think that the community grows stronger if the commons uh, data is available to anyone who wants it. I don't think every person will ever look at all of this data, but there has to be people in the community like me who want to get this data without asking, I don't, I don't want to ask Gitcoin for the data on their own smart contract because now I've established trust with Gitcoin. I shouldn't have to do that because I want to support the Gitcoin community. Um, so that's kind of why I'm building what I'm building and, and that's what we built. So mm -hmm. um, thanks. Yeah, thanks for presenting, Jay. I mean, I was uh, particularly interested in the last part since I have my, uh, collected my own experience on uh, getting price feeds. Um, this is something really super valuable to have this as a comments that is super relevant. I wonder what, what are the thoughts? Um, what do you think? How could we apply this to Gitcoin Grant? So that you have been demonstrating some tracing. Um, what are your ideas? I mean, it might not be directly related to quadratic funding, or it may be. Um, so what are your thoughts there? Right. So I was showing like where you could you could extract exactly every event that was emitted by um, by the Gitcoin grant contract. And um, I can extract it into basically uh, a file that I can replay. Um, and then each time a, uh, you know, I can, I can write a small amount of code to do the math that we were just looking at a few minutes ago, right? Um, and replay the actual transaction so that we can see uh, what happens. So it's very similar to modeling in, in the way that you guys do the modeling. Um, for me, it's not using remote data and it's not using um, interpreted data. So I can write really fast code that can duplicate the history of the entire chain or the entire smart contract. And then I can iterate and play with different possibilities. And, it, and it's very, very fast because it's compiled C code in the end. Uh, that's kind of what, what I'm interested in a little bit. But you, you actually inspired me to look at that pricing thing. I kind of always knew that you could get token prices directly from Uniswap. And, uh, you know, I can see building a tool, maybe it's called Shifra Space Pricing or something that gets you a token price. Yeah, I mean, particularly for all these decentralized taxes, I mean, yeah. having the, this price feeds as a commons, I mean, this, this is relevant for all kinds of automated market making referring to external price signals and, and 
all the value extract in those pools is driven by external price signals. So this is really a huge thing. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I think fundamentally, if you, if you commit to being decentralized, you kind of have to um, uh, figure some of these things out. And an easy way to get a price is just to go to an API, and that's great, but it doesn't really push the ball forward for me. I want to see what it's like to be fully decentralized. That's kind of what I did. So did anybody else have any questions? So I know it's not directly applicable, but we're, we're um, in open or uh, closed beta. So if you're interested in getting some of these tools, please hit me up and I'll, I'll post something to the, uh, to the uh, Discord. Yeah, awesome, please do. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, Jay. Uh, I would be really interested in playing around with these tools. I'd also be um, where my mind is going with this. I think it'd be neat to make some sort of Python API over top of the tools um, to bring it right into the data science environment. Sure, that'd be really excellent. I'm the worst Python person on earth. I'm, I'm as bad at Python. I am good at C. So that's awesome. Yeah, I'd be happy to work with you on that. Absolutely, that'd be great. Yeah, I just want to say I think that was amazingly, amazing. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure if I think maybe you cut out. Yeah, that was yeah, really, really good. Super interesting. Um, uh, thanks for that. I, like, I can definitely see where, how, how useful that is. I used to, um, I used to work for a company who that investigated basically activity on the blockchain. Um, on all these different blockchains, so I can see immediately how this would be of like great value to them. Um, is the is the intention at some point? Are you kind of intending to build, I guess, a front end for this, or what's the kind of proposed? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we've already started on the front end. I didn't have time to show that, but um, the. Uh, commands, each of those commands is also a, 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 a route in an API. And then we can build our front end directly against that API. Um, and we've made pretty good progress there. Um, you know, I'm still struggling with like how you do this without kind of giving away the farm, if that makes any sense. So I'm a little uh, confused by how you build a product and give away a commons at the same time. It's a little confusing, but. Uh... But I think, I think the, the data, that index part of the data, I think if that's not a commons, if that's not available to everyone, what will happen is someone's gonna capture that, that piece of information. And it's such valuable information to make this data accessible to everybody, that I think that has to be a comment, the, the index part of the, of the thing. Cool, well, yeah, thank you. Thank you a lot for that, yeah. I just had the funny idea, I don't know how, how much effort this would take to have, uh, I'd say, a regular update on the current state, define some metrics on Gitcoin Grant and then observe via using your indexing um, observe uh, day by day or week by week what's what's actually right now going on in Gitcoin Grants Round 9. Yeah, it'd be very, very interesting. I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a website builder, so I always kind of like don't know how to build a website, as ridiculous as that sounds, but... Um, you know. I mean, it could be just sharing, share, well, define one, two, three metrics together and then... Uh, just publish it. It could be a yeah, hack and right, right. or whatever screenshots, tweets, right, right. the current status, or only in in our group could be just a fun fun exercise and demonstration of the capabilities. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm I'm open to anybody helping. I mean, within the last probably uh, three months, I've gotten to the point where I feel like I can uh, have a, a beta, like a closed beta, because it's still a little bit bumpy here and there. 
So we're trying to iron out the difficulties of people getting started with the data. So. Okay. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions on Jay's presentation? Okay, if not, then we have some time left to dig into our working groups again. Perhaps before we split up, um, at the moment we have two working groups. It's the math working group and it's the machine learning AI working group. Um, if you made your own, own choice, then I think for you it's pretty clear what what to do next i hope so uh, for the rest of you is there anybody who um well haven't make a decision what research topic to work on or any open questions here no darian nico Irvin. I don't know what's the latest stage on your end. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, awesome. And also feel free to drop questions here in the channel in the meantime. If you ever feel something relevant or uh, need input, you never know. Somebody might be able to point you in the right direction or give a valuable feedback. Feel free to share it in the channel. The cat cat, cat cat uh, boot camp. Oh yeah, yeah. This again for anyone who haven't tried cat cat. It's a really cool course online, free and gives a, a very good, um, well, introduction to the power opportunity with using the CatCat package for simulations, particularly in the token engineering field. Great. Oh yeah, <laughs> thanks for recording. And I will share the link, um, the G drive, um, to upload it and make it available for anyone, for everyone, right? So after, after the session. So thanks a lot for recording, Erin.